Well, doing this fine Saturday afternoon. If any of you were at the, uh, uh, take a look at the uh, Chameleon Hour that was premiered last night, you know we are talking about plants, keeping your plants healthy. But there's a lot of other things that we talked about, that I talked about on that show. Now, uh, we need to get a, a couple of things out of the way first. Hello, Jenny. <clears throat> oh, oh, Jenny says uh, this will be an interesting Chameleons and coffee. I'm a cereal plant killer. Hey, James, very good to see you. Yeah, well, uh, first I need to uh, say, uh, uh, let everybody know. Hello, Natalie. Uh, there has been some concern that uh, I was not being forthright with you all and that uh, when we had chameleons and coffee, I didn't always have coffee in this cup. Hey, Howard. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, specifically tell the naysayers that I always have coffee in my cup. And uh, this is a an important part of my uh, my contract with you, the trust that is built up between you and I, uh, that chameleons and coffee, always has coffee in the cup <clears throat> so i just want to just want to let you know i'm on the up and up and uh let's see uh oh well, hello steph ranunculus uh let's see is it always hot coffee bill um howard it isn't always hot coffee uh it is often cold brew and today we have a uh, special blend. It's called the Muffin Man. It's from uh, a place called Bodhi Coffee. <clears throat> and I usually don't go out and get one necessarily for this show. But uh, I kind of figured, uh, you know, it it's important enough. It's important enough for me to be uh, keeping things fresh on this show that, you know, I bring in other things. Uh, other other coffees. But uh, this is really good. So it's got a little hint of blueberry in it. So. Uh, you can see it definitely creamy. Hey, we got someone from Scotland, Lazaru. Welcome. Welcome. Look at that. I love that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. So, we just had a, a very cool uh, chameleon hour that talked about plants and specifically how to keep them alive. Perry Planeta, hello. Hello, wonderful to have you here. Hello, Richard from San Bruno. Um, so plants, this is a big thing. And, and I want to do a focus on plants uh, this, this year. Joanne, you made it. Hello, Michael. MGN, well, hello, Michael. Very good to see you. Uh, and as you know, I love uh, Tim from Michigan. Excellent. Uh, Richard and San Bruno has a new carpet chameleon arriving next week. Excellent. <clears throat> Anybody who saw the show know that I'm I'm talking up carpet chameleons. I think this is great for our community. Uh, but uh, Zev Green Reptiles, Matthew from Carpentaria. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a nice place from Michigan. All right. So <clears throat> what is it with plants? Well, the thing is, often we chameleon keepers don't do a whole lot, uh, don't always do well with plants. Now, I love plants, and so, uh, and it's amazing what happens when you uh, have a, 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 a hybrid cage and you start fogging. You know, with the, the latest in chameleon husbandry, you start using that, and it's amazing what happens with the plants inside your cage. They just absolutely go nuts. And uh, you're going to see in uh, probably the next chameleon hour. Uh, I actually have a, a four foot cage, and my pothos went down and uh, got out of their their pots, and they went uh, all the way down to the uh, the soil floor. They embedded themselves in the floor, and then they started growing up. You know, in the wild, pothos is not a hanging plant. It is it. It grows up trees. And this thing is insane. I've got huge leaves. Uh, and so when you let these plants do what they want to do, it's amazing what, what they will do. So, <clears throat> sorry. 
So uh, I want to say we just uh, there's so much fun that we can have with plants. And uh, yeah, Howard's saying no bots today. Yep. The uh, uh, so if anybody uh, comes on talking about Fortnite, I kick them off. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. <laughs> That's my wife. That's Yvette. Hello, Yvette. Thank you for joining. So, um, and so we're going to be talking about how to determine if your or how to keep your plants healthy. Um, let's see. Alano for twenty. As everybody knows, this is a live session, so I, I value interaction. I, I don't want this to be just me talking because if you want to just hear me talking, you go to a podcast and you can hear me talking for a long time. So I will, I do uh, inter interrupt myself if if there's things going on in the chat. Patrick from Madagascar. Oh my goodness. Hello, this is Patrick. He was my guide from Madagascar uh, when I recently went to Madagascar. And uh, hey, Patrick, in the last, uh, the last chameleon hour, I did a whole clip about that uh, female panther chameleon that we saw laying eggs in the, uh, in the walkway. Very good to have you here. And um, <clears throat> let's see, I have a co-host, my angel wing begonia, which is a little bit leggy. So I'm not terribly happy with uh, how things are going. I'm getting better. I'm going to repot this one. But uh, it's it's growing, and I've actually done a uh, some cuttings off of it, and I've reproduced it in one of my bioactive cages. And uh, so it's really cool. So let's see. Uh, let's, so let's talk about uh, some of the... Well, first of all, my special espresso drink here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one's good. This one's good. Um, any good suggestions for an indoor tree that would be good for a chameleon playpen? Well, okay. So if you're talking about a something that goes inside of the cage... I actually recommend not doing a tree at all, but just having a bunch of branches that are set up that are perfect for the chameleon and then have hanging plants around it. Um, the problem is when you you want everything within a one plant, like the cover, the drinking surfaces, and the perching surfaces, then you're talking about a tree that needs to grow pretty big. And that's usually too big for our... Uh, our uh, cages like if you get a ficus tree it just never really becomes what it needs to be to fully do all of those three jobs perfectly um, now if you're talking about just having a uh, a plant sitting in your living room uh, that is also a little bit problematic because uh, you don't have enough light for that tree in your living room for the kind of trees that will give you those big leaves and those branches and uh, and all of that. So uh, it, it's a tough thing to do to find one plant that does it all. I would say <laughs> uh, a large hibiscus, when these things get large, like eight feet tall, then you're, then you're really talking. Uh, but I, I just honestly, I like to, do, I like to get branches that do the branch job, plants that do the leaf job, and, uh, and and I don't require one plant to do both. Now, I know you are very general question, so I don't know what the details of your question were. I just went off on my own. Uh, so if you need any more explanation or I didn't go in the direction you wanted, uh, go ahead and let me know. Uh, give me a second here. All right, I'm back. All right, Ranunculus says, podcast was great today while driving. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, that's uh, I really like to do that for my podcast listeners. Even if I have a video interview, I put it on the podcast because uh, and, and by the way, it is edited for podcast listening. And so it's not just repurposed. I hate that with repurposing. E each one of these uh, these platforms is special in its own way. Let's see. It's Tim Waltz um, says. I do have a question about the creeping Jew vining plants, Tradescantia. I've heard it's safe, but also that it's not safe. Well, the uh, the biggest uh, issue with Tradescantia, that was uh, also called the wandering Jew, is that it breaks off easily. 
And uh, other than that, it's fine. I, I, I use them often in my chameleon cages. I love to look at them. They provide a cover. Uh, but yeah, if a chameleon walks all over them, they can break. And, uh, and uh, I'm okay with that because I've got a, if I've got a dirt floor, they just go down and they just make more plants there. Uh, in my, my large cage, my, my four foot cage, uh, the floor there, I didn't, everything that I tried to plant in that floor is gone. It is now taken over by Pothos, Satin Pothos, and the Wandering Jew, Tradescantia. And they've just created this massive, beautiful uh, 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 cage. And so uh, it's wonderful when you let them all just do what they want to do. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, Natalie says, I'm a chronic overwaterer and overlighter. Well, we usually don't get overlighter unless we're putting them under the heat lamp. But um, usually the problem with chameleon cages is they're underlit. So you've at least got that. <laughs> and chronic overwaterer. I uh, actually that's usually it's underwatering. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, unless the uh, the misting nozzle is pointed directly at the soil, then yeah, that's a problem. So let's see. Perry Planeta says, try coffee brand coffee. All right. Well, uh, I will be trying chameleon brand cold brew. Uh, I like that. Joanne uh, just got a beautiful begonia yesterday. Yeah, these are uh, these are begonias, and uh, begonias aren't often used in chameleon cages. But the more we get into uh, bioactive, the more begonias we're going to be seeing, I think. Uh, Matthew is saying Bailey's. No, this isn't Bailey's. This is espresso. Uh, yeah, it does look ba like Bailey's, but it's just espresso. It's a special drink called the Muffin Man. It's got a little bit of blueberry and uh, uh, a lot of, I'm not sure what kind of cream. I think it's oat milk. I think it's oat milk in here. Let's see. Howard is saying it's easy to water pothos, but having different plants with different watering needs makes it difficult to have too many different plants. <clears throat> you know, what I have found, you know, when you get these plants that are nice, big, and full, I, at least in my experience, it's really hard for that the water from our misters to get down into the soil. And so I have a lot of big, full plants that the mist gets on the leaves, but the soil is just bone dry. It just doesn't get uh, watered. And so I have to go in and hand water all of my plants. And so um, I actually control how much water they have, even though there's a automatic misters in there. Uh, I find that it, when you fog at night and keep a lot of fog in that cage, it's good for the chameleon and it's great for the plants. And so I'll go in every weekend, like my chore, after after I'm done with uh, this show is I'm watering all of the plants. And uh, and even though even if they've got misters, I still have to water them. So I, I know everybody's got a different situation. But um, yeah, that's what I find when my plants get big and full that I can miss them as much as I want to. And they are not. Uh, they're not getting enough water. So I got to go out and supplement that water. Uh, question, uh, okay. So suggestion for the umbrella plants, but they grow big. Yeah. The Schifflera arboricola are, uh, good plants. If you want to have a plant that grows, uh, grows up and will fill the cage. Thing is they don't have a whole lot of horizontal branches. Um, they, they, they do like to grow up. And so, uh, he, it's good to supplement Schifflera with those horizontal branches. Uh, I like ficus, but I keep killing them. All the leaves start falling off from the bottom up. Yeah. And, and that may be from, you know, either under, you know what? The problem with plants, underwatering, overwatering, too much light, not enough light. And it's one of those four. And, and which one it is depends upon your conditions and your habits. And so everybody, we all have to figure out what our one one thing is that's going to uh, keep us from keeping live plants in our chameleon enclosures. Uh, Nuculus says, was got told that angel wings are very poisonous to reptiles. I don't know better. Well, um, honestly, I don't either. 
Question is, did the people saying that uh, say that after chameleons bit their uh, begonia? Did they say that after reptiles? I mean, who? Uh, there are a lot of charts out there that uh, that list plants that are poisonous, but there aren't a whole lot of charts that list plants that are poisonous for chameleons. Now, <clears throat> is this angel wing begonia uh, poisonous? I don't know. It's been hanging out with my panther chameleon for uh, many, 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 many months. I don't know how long. Uh, now I haven't seen him try to eat it. So uh, maybe we'll learn that they're poisonous, but I wouldn't go off of any specific chart. And if anybody starts talking about plants being poisonous, uh, gently inquire as to where they're getting their information, because if they're getting it off of some chart on some website, um, then yeah, maybe poisonous to humans, maybe poisonous to dogs, maybe poisonous to horses, birds. But uh, we're doing we're we're playing a different game here with chameleons, and uh, chameleons have chewed up a lot of plants that uh, have been considered poisonous, like um, like uh, what is it, croton, croton, very poisonous, right? Well, you go to the Chameleon Academy website, you see a picture of a croton that's been bitten out of it that has had its leaves chewed by a veiled chameleon and the veiled chameleon has no problem with it. Now, once again, poison is both substance as well as dose. So maybe if they ate a whole plant, it would be a problem. Maybe if they ate two plants, don't know. Uh, but the fact is we don't know and we shouldn't assume that everything that is poisonous for whatever that chart was made for is poisonous for chameleons. Um, yeah, it's just, it's part of the exploration that we need to go through. Who take care, Matthew's asking, who take care of your plants and animals while you are gone? My incredibly beautiful and wonderful and understanding and supportive wife did, as well as uh, various family members that came to help out. But uh, yeah, it was not insignificant to, uh, to do that. Uh, Costa Mesa, Genevieve from Costa Mesa is here. Wonderful. Jason, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, Eliza says, are there some good plant lights you can recommend for chameleon enclosure? I like to use T5 6500K lights as well as uh, light bars. The Arcadia uh, Jungle Dawns are the ones that I use. Uh, and I've been very happy with those. They've given me a lot of good plant growth. But the more light, the better. We, we do not have a problem, unless you're Natalie, we don't have a problem with over lighting in the cages <laughs> she says she has a problem with over lighting and uh that would be a rare one uh, usually people have these little caves with a little miner's light that they call a chameleon cage and uh, we need a lot more light than that uh, <laughs> warren's asking or howard's asking how do you keep a hibiscus alive without natural sunlight? I don't. I keep my hibiscus outside. I do not use hibiscus as an indoor plant. I don't use hibiscus in my chameleon cages. The only way you're going to be able to do that is by a whole lot more light than we usually give them. So maybe if you had a whole bank of uh, LED bars, you could you could uh, maybe make it happen. Uh, I've been able to get a passion flower to bloom inside of a cage uh, using the LED bars. So. Uh, that that may be what brings a whole, these LED bars may be what brings a whole new uh, era of chameleon plant keeping. But right now, uh, as far as I know, my experience, hibiscus is a difficult one to do long term. Uh, you can bring one in that has been souped up on fertilizers and all that kind of stuff, and they will live for a little while in the cage and they will uh, and they will uh, bloom in the cage for a little while. But long term, we have just had a real hard time doing it. I know some people say they've been successful at it and it may, and, and the question is, have they been successful at it for more than a year? Because yes, you can get these plants souped up on fertilizers and they will last for a while. Uh, but uh, it's, I, I just don't use hibiscus because of how hard it is on the plant. It's not meant to be in there. Um, but I will encourage everybody who loves hibiscus, 
uh, go ahead and let's experiment with these new lighting systems and see if we can get uh, hibiscus to thrive in chameleon cages because it's a wonderful plant to use. Um, Periplanetas saying Jungle Dawn LEDs are great. I've had great success with them. Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. We have somebody from Facebook. Hi from the UK. Can you clear up something? Pothos okay or not for veiled chameleons as I see a lot of contradictions. Uh, we have been using pothos with veiled chameleons for decades and pothos have been chewing on pothos for decades and they are doing just fine. Uh, I know that there's uh, pockets of, especially on Facebook, there's pockets of people who say, oh, it's horrible. And uh, when you get down, you dig down into why they say that, it, it's like one, one necropsy with a whole lot of logical leaps that when you apply it to the, 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 uh, the world outside, it just doesn't hold water. Uh, here, here's the thing. You come up with a great, uh, idea. Okay, so pothos is going to suck up calcium or something like that. You apply it. You say, okay, if that's true, how would the world look if that were true? And we would need a whole lot more incidences of veiled chameleons getting sick off of eating pothos than there are now. Right now, veiled chameleons eat pothos with abandon. They just mow them down, Schiflera, all of these, every, all these things that have uh, ox, um, oxalates, they just mow them down and they don't die. So a chameleon that dies with pothos in its gut, uh, that's, that's not an indication that the pothos killed the chameleon. Um, and, and it's, there, there's so many other things you've got to test before you start making that logical leap. So yes, there are pockets of the online community that believe that pothos are not okay for, uh, veiled chameleons. Uh, the rest of the world is using pothos with veiled chameleons and having no problem. So, uh, you know, go with what you want to. Uh, I personally use pothos extensively with, uh, my veiled chameleons. Uh, Mixu, hello, Sean. Welcome. On my way to for more plants for baby cages. Excellent, excellent. Uh, going and chopping for plants is one of the funnest things. Uh, Eliza says, I was looking at the Jungle Dawn LEDs. Are there other brands that work just as well? Uh I haven't explored a whole lot of other brands. Uh, I do use the uh, the LED bars with Leap. Uh, those work great for the Leap cages. Uh, the uh, the Jungle Dawns are still brighter. And when I'm going into my, my four foot tall cage, I really want as bright as possible. And so uh, I've been using a lot of the Jungle Dawn LED uh, bars. Uh, I am, of course, open to uh, uh, whatever else is out there. Uh, I'm sure that there are other uh, plant, I mean, the plant industry is wonderful for us. That's that's where I get all of my fixtures, my 6500K fixtures. And uh, I, I'm sure they've got some really good lighting, uh, LED lighting. And that's that's where we should look uh, for, for these. And so, uh, yeah, if you find some good stuff, some things that are brighter than the uh, Jungle Dawns or some way better, you let me know. But right now I've been using Jungle Dawns for, uh, been using them for a while. Um, let's see. Uh, Periplaneta says uh, metal halide, mercury vapor, and Jungle Dawn LED are your best bets. Uh, if they were careful about metal halide and mercury vapor, they do put off UVB, but they also put off a lot of heat. And uh, in my enclosed cages, I got to watch that. So uh, just, just be careful of heat. Uh, let's see. To do... Oh, my goodness. Oh, hello, Daniel. Dr. Mark Schertz has made it to a live show. Oh, my goodness. Congratulations. It is very good to have you here. Uh, Nathan Gray is asking, how far up do you recommend holding a Jungle Dawn LED bar above the enclosure? I put the Jungle Dawn bar uh, directly on the enclosure. It can be raised up, but it doesn't have any UVB, so I don't have to worry about it 
uh, uh, being bad for the chameleon. Uh, now, it will put off a little bit of heat, and so you just got to make sure if you have a chameleon that's walking under it that it's not going to burn itself, but uh, it, it's very low heat. It's not like a, an incandescent bulb, so uh, I actually don't worry about it. Now, uh, I also have them with only with my adult chameleons. Uh, I will, if I use them with uh, the baby chameleons, uh, they're generally uh, above... Uh, uh, above the cage, because if I have smaller uh, cages, I have to be very careful about it. Uh, there being heat buildup. And so I don't like to have lights directly on top of baby cages. Uh, not that that's bad. Don't, don't go around saying Bill said, don't put lights on top of baby cages. Just be mindful that lights put off heat. Even, even the low lights, even the fluorescent lights, everything puts off heat. And in a larger cage, four foot tall cage, okay, it just dissipates, no problem. In if you've got just a, a foot tall cage that's six inches wide, that's everything starts to accumulate. And so that is why I don't put my Jungle Dawn LED bars or any light for that matter, directly on top of a, uh, a baby cage. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, for adults, I don't worry about it so much. I actually moved the, I moved the uh, LED bar <laughs> to the place that I need uh, where my uh, my plants that love light need it. Uh, all right, all right. I'm going to catch up with my uh, my comments here. Let's see, James Cross, who uh, has a lot of experience with larger cages. Uh, he's using ficus as his main plant. Does well in his cages. So they are large cages. Yes, and um, definitely that that's the key. Is uh, it's, t it's difficult for a ficus to really uh, come into its full potential in a two foot by two foot cage. But if you're doing like a four foot wide cage or even larger, uh, I know James is working with uh, Parsons chameleons and large cages. That's where the ficus can really start to expand and come into its own. And, and uh, yeah, guys, I, I encourage everybody <laughs> get the largest cage you can because uh, you, the experience is so much better, not only for the chameleon, but you start being able to, to sculpt and landscape the cage in ways that is a little bit more difficult with the two by two by four. So yes, thank you very much for that input, James. Um, Howard's, uh, I had to buy a water sprayer. As you mentioned, the mist is not enough. Yep. And actually, I love those little medicine bottles that you just squirt water out. Uh, it's kind of fun. I can just, uh, so you, you get those little sprayers. I know I got those little, uh, where is it? I don't have it here. But those little medicine bottles are that little beaker uh, uh, bottles that you squirt. And it uh, sends out a stream of water. And I like those because I can stand at the outside of the cage and I can aim it directly for the uh, the pot. Uh, people have mentioned, well, why don't you just get a sprayer, that uh, pressure sprayer and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and I realize, yes, that is more effective, more efficient. But uh, having a little squirt bottle, that's more fun. Jeez. I actually get a super soaker gun and a squirt gun and uh, and use that. But somehow you got to get it in, uh, in amongst the cage. I mean, you look at that uh, Pothos cage behind me, uh, being able to get to the... Uh, the actual soil can be a challenge, but <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, Ranunculus started to implement some bromeliads, hoping they will thrive. They they should, they should. But uh, you know, one thing, what I love is things like this, where you start uh, experimenting with different plants in the chameleon cage. Uh, that's that's where we start to get some fun things because, like my cage behind me. You see behind me, that's my pothos cage that uh, has five different varieties of pothos in it. And uh, I'm just having fun. And uh, I'm going to be doing one that's going to have the uh, at least the major varieties of prayer plant. Uh, and that, that's one thing. And and mark my words, I will I will have a, a maiden's hair fern long term. I've been able to. Uh, I actually had some great success with those in my um, bioactive cages. Uh, the problem actually in the bioactive cages, the, my leap bioactive cages, 
is the other plants outcompeted my maiden hair. So uh, I gotta, I'm gonna be working with the maiden hair fern in one of my larger cages in its own pot. I'm gonna make it work. I'm gonna be you just you just watch, you just hang out here throughout this year and you're gonna see it work. Um let's see. Uh let's see. Uh Lazaru from Scotland says, I have just bought two large ficus, so hopefully they last a while. It's told not to repot, as that can make them drop leaves. There's a lot of things that make ficus drop their leaves. Those those crazy things. They drop the leaves, and then they say, okay, now I'm going to make make new leaves for this new situation. Yeah, ficus are, are, are moody. <laughs> They're moody. Um, oh, oh, Joanne, bringing up a great point. Uh, Boltitude... Can't believe the multitude of blooms on my goldfish and lipstick plants. Uh, everybody, if you want a uh, a plant that has awesome flowers that would do great in your chameleon cage, and, and they're not big like the hibiscus, but the goldfish plant and the lipstick plants have bright yellow, red flowers. And like the goldfish plant, the flowers kind of shaped like a goldfish. And lipstick plant, you get this lipstick type, uh, type flower. They're just gorgeous and so there are so many things that uh we can we can do in our chameleon cages once we start making the environment uh suitable for plants and so it's not just the pothos that can handle uh, being abused that uh, will survive in our cages and and i gotta tell you this is a side effect of uh, our latest husbandry methods of using uh, high humidity uh, high humidity nights, the uh, the the low the low misting and uh, the uh, keeping the humidity in, uh, and, and the higher light. There's so much more we can do with uh, with plants, and I love it. Um, let's see, Heidi's talking about some plant apps that tell you what you uh, what your plants needs to survive. It, you know what? I've never used. I've seen so many of those apps, and I've been wondering about them. I've been thinking about trying some. Uh, I, I'm going to have to try some. Uh, Tim Waltz is asking. Madagascar must have been so exciting. Oh my goodness! There is so much that I learned, and uh, and I did a number of learning videos uh, of just discussions, and I'm going to be putting them out like in every chameleon hour. Uh, for those who don't know, the Chameleon Hour is a show that I do on YouTube uh, every other week. I just did one uh, yesterday, at, and I premiere it at uh, 5 p.m. on Fridays. Um, they're available forever. It's just when we premiere, I'm there in the chat So for the first showing. Uh, but I'm going to be doing uh, one of those segments of things I learned in Madagascar every, uh, every time I do a Chameleon Hour, which is every other Friday. Um, so... Do, do, do. Facebook user, my Schifflera, that's the umbrella plant, end up dying suddenly, found it had scale. I want to put a big rubber tree in with my veil. Any issues with those? I don't know about rubber trees. Uh, I have not used a rubber tree uh, because it's, it's mainly, um, yeah, it doesn't have the branch structure I'm looking for. Once again, trees have a hard time in two by two by four foot cages. Uh, even if you can keep them alive, they just don't come into their own. Uh, and it just becomes easier to put branches in and then a trailing plant for leaves and have just uh, don't require one plant to do both jobs because uh, with the when you do something like a rubber tree or uh, maybe these these uh, figs, uh, you end up getting this this uh, trunk through the middle of your cage, taking up a whole lot of space. And then it's got to grow big enough to uh, spread out. And then there isn't a whole lot of room to spread out. And so uh, that, that's why I really don't go much for uh, trees. Uh, but um, let's see. Oh, oh, wait. Okay, James has a, a comment coming up. Hello from Ireland. Very good to have you join. I love seeing all these different countries coming in. And, uh, oh, Ranuncula is asking a question that I love. Any tips on how to make Maranta big and lush? Yes, I do. 
um, propagate them, do leaf cuttings. And then once the leaf cuttings are, um, uh, are rooted, you put them back into the original pot. And so that's, that's the trick that they do to us to make uh, something at Home Depot look so incredibly lush. That's not one plant. What they do is they just put multiple plants in there that are growing out. And so that's one way that you can get the, uh, we can do that with um, prayer plants. And yes, I am in the process of doing that, but uh, uh, that makes it look beautiful. Because I know when, when, when you're good at growing your prayer plant, you're saying, well, wait a minute, it keeps spreading. But I'm losing that that crown of leaves that was so beautiful to begin with. This is the solution. Uh, do some leaf cuttings, root them in propagation chambers, or just little cups of glass. You just do it in a cup of water. Put the uh, the uh, the leaf with the growing node in the water. It will root. You put it back into your original pot, and you will soon have a nice big bushy uh, collective. All right. Uh, let's see. Ficus uh, James uh, wanted us to uh, dig into this. Ficus is my main plant. I have a very large, very large habitats, five by four by three. Yep, that's a good size. I like the way you can shape them like bonsai into hiding spots and around my branches, which I use mostly Monsanita. Ah, I hate Monsanita. But okay, the, the world doesn't all have to have, have to. Uh, mold around what I like, uh, but uh, they are James's favorite. Okay. All right. Well, I know James does incredibly well and I love his enclosures and all of his stuff. So, uh, so I will. Uh, <laughs> so yes, I respect all those. If anybody, uh, uh, his name on Instagram is Crosscut. So uh, you can take a look at some great enclosures that James works with. Uh, Oh, hey, Mark, uh, talking about bromeliads. Bromeliads aren't, are really great. No, sorry. Bromeliads are really great, but they're not great for chameleons in terms of structure to climb on. Sometimes they have very sharp edges and don't occur in the old world at all. That's what you get for asking a scientist. Um, yeah, the, the, there is a number of bromeliads that have sharp edges, so you definitely watch out for that one. And uh, yeah, they're, they're, for, uh, they're for looking pretty. Looking pretty. Uh, let's see. Okay. Facebook user Phil uh, Pothos is widely used in the U.S. with multiple species of chameleons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He was just, we're talking about the Pothos uh, uh, discussion again. Um, <laughs> okay. Joanne uh, is uh, talking about. She, she has goldfish plants, and those are plants that have these uh, really cool yellow and orange flowers that kind of look like goldfish. And uh, apparently, her chameleon likes to eat the gold the uh, goldfish. <laughs> That's, that is very cool. All right. So Stephanie is going to talk about hibiscus, have four hibiscus indoors, and have never had a problem. Bill, you don't know what you're talking about. They are over four years old. Even get flowers sometimes. I don't have plant lights on them. I keep them right in front of a south-facing window. All right, everybody. There you go. There is an example of someone who has kept hibiscus indoors. Never had a problem. And uh, her strategy is to keep them in front of a south-facing window. So, okay. There's your data point. And... Uh, uh, and so uh, I, I, I would like to see more people successful with hibiscus indoors. Um, and one of these days, I'm going to try it. Uh, I'm going to try it. Matthew says, once we're in talking about hibiscus, Matthew says, I've only got my hibiscus to grow in my sunrooms. All right. Well, the point is hibiscus love light. And uh, Stephanie has enough of that light coming in through her south-facing window. And Matthew needs a sunroom. And so uh, everybody, that's just uh, try try it. Try hibiscus in your situation. And uh, just know the signs when they don't have enough light. They get start getting leggy and they're losing leaves. But uh, find a place in your house where it's got a lot of light. 
Um, see, we're talking about the pothos in chameleon cages. Thanks. UK Facebook group recommends not. So wanted to double check. Yeah, well, they're the group that that decided that pothos was bad for chameleons. And so if you listen to them, you won't keep pothos in your cage. Uh, anybody else in the world does a lot with pothos. So you just decide what you want to go with. Uh, oh, okay. Here, here's some uh, hint from Stephanie. Hibiscus need to fully dry out between mist waterings. And keep an eye out for thrips and spider mites. Those almost killed mine a few times. Okay. Thank you very much. Fully dry out between waterings. All right. Sounds good. Let's see. Emerald Garrett. Uh, Jenny saying passion flower is deemed poisonous, but only the leaves. Yes, there's some uh, species that have arsenic. My girl loves a snack on the inner purple flower petals. I tried them. They are super sweet. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I've used a lot of passion flowers with my chameleons. I love them very much. Um, all right. Let's see. Stephanie says, interested in spider farmer plant lights. Okay. Sounds like something we ought to check out. Uh, I am I am all for finding brighter uh, brighter uh, lights and a pitcher plant goes wild. Hmm. I am not sure what the, uh, the, uh, the context of that is, but pitcher plants are wonderful. Uh, Joanne, what do you mean? You mean yours has gone wild? Uh, that I would love to see a picture of that, uh, for everybody. Nepenthes pitcher plants, uh, are just, they do, uh, if you get the right varieties, uh, like Miranda, uh, or, or these, uh, Ventrata that you find at, uh, the, the stores, they do very well in chameleon cages, but they need a lot of light. So, uh, Joanne, I'd love to hear more about, uh, which one you've got. Um, Howard's as asking about a, uh, Vivo Suns four times 6,500 high output lamp. So he's talking about a, a fluorescent fixture that has four, uh, fluorescent lamps, T5 lamps in it. I use the Vivo Sun four times 6,500K high output lamps. Uh, they uh, they work fine uh, on top of uh, your standard screen cage uh, or your standard two by two by four foot cage. Uh, other than that, uh, I mean, they, they do the, they handle the weight fine, the cages do, uh, but I also use them, oh, you can see, there's mine right now, uh, on top of the baker's rack. And, uh, and so once I put them in these baker's racks, I can actually use, uh, these fixtures that have six bulbs and I can get all sorts of crazy light. Um, I was worried about, it seems heavy to have it sit on the enclosure. Uh, it's, it, I've used it and it hasn't been a problem with me. Uh, so I'll just say my personal experience. Ryan has his Ustaletai getting some natural sun today. Excellent. Excellent. Hello, Juan. Um, do, 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 do. All right. All right. Hi, Rob. I'm trying to catch up on my comments here. <laughs> Jenny says, oh, I hate maiden, fair, maiden hair fur, and I tried so many times I've given up. I will not give it up. Yes, I have tried and failed many times, but I'm going to crack that nut. Um, let's see. James is asking, what is a good low light plant that thrives? Ugh, pothos. <laughs> pothos is just awesome. Um, yeah, you know, especially when you start getting into like the jade pothos that, uh, over here, the, the green leaves, uh, if you start getting into the variegated leaves, they need more light, but pothos does great. Uh, Schiflera tends to tends to do better than i expect but as far as low light i think pothos is our best bet uh, for a chameleon plant let's see tim waltz double pot method that bill uses works great excellent the dragon certain attachment gives you something to zip tie them to yes yes the dragon ledge is specifically meant so you could uh, put uh put pots and plants up where the chameleons need them but yes double pot double pot method that tim is talking about uh I talked about in yesterday's uh, show 
and that is where that is where you uh, mount a pot to your structure, and then you plant the pot in an identical uh, plant the plant in an identical pot. Hey, that needs to go. Err. Oh well. And then when you want to put it back in, you just slide it in. Oh, oh. And uh, that makes it really easy to change out plants if they need to be rotated, go out into the sun or stuff. And uh, when you want to, you just get a different uh, different look to your cage because you just uh, switch out the plants. And uh, so it's it's a lot of fun. So all right, I'm going to get to back to my uh, my uh, espresso here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just came across a load of new straight hazel branches. Hope these are suitable. I've never tried hazel, um, so I don't know. I, I most branches are okay, especially if they're uh, they're dried, um, as long as they don't have sap or something coming out of it. So chances are it's good. But I haven't tried hazel branches, so I I don't know what they look like. Um, hey, I have somebody on Facebook that says Bill. Unfortunately. Facebook on some groups doesn't allow me to know who you are. Privacy. Yeah. Coming from Facebook. That's, that's rich. But uh, anyway, let me know who you are. And I say, hello. <laughs> so, okay. 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 Um, will you make a list with the Latin names of the plants since I live in Denmark and the names does not always translate? Oh yes. The problem with <laughs> going across borders. Uh, if you go to chameleonacademy.com backslash plants. That is where I have all of this official information. And uh, in there, I do use the uh, the Latin names to describe the plants. And so uh, if we're talking about things that just, yeah, I mean, Schaflera, that's the uh, uh, that's the uh, Latin name. Uh, when we're talking about Wandering Jew, Trinascantia is a Latin name. Pothos, okay. Yeah, it used to be Pothos, but then they kept changing the name and uh, the name kept getting more and more ridiculous and everybody just said uh, we're good with pothos but that is a uh, epiprenem epiprenem that's it that that's why we didn't that's why we didn't uh, change to those names we like pothos uh the prayer plants maranta but yeah uh just go to chameleonacademy.com backslash plants and i have uh the common names as as well as the uh, the Latin names listed there for most of the stuff, most of the stuff. Um, Jenny is asking, what do you guys use to fertilize your plants? You know what? I'm going to try that uh, fish poop <laughs> that we talked about, that Elizabeth talked about in uh, yesterday's show and on the latest podcast. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to try that. Um, so far, I haven't been, I haven't been consistently fertilizing my plants. Uh, and, and I want to, I want to get better at that. I want to, I want to do more farming of the plants inside. I do a lot of it, but I, I just, I'm not formalized in what I do. I just kind of do things. So I'm, I'm going to get better at that. And, uh, and since this, uh, this show, Chameleon Academy podcast and the Chameleon Hour is all about my journey, you all get to come with me, uh, <laughs> because that's what it's all about. Um, So Natalie says, i am been making a planter box for a cage I have. It's really meant for small mammals, but if I can make it work, I'd like to have a planter box rather than a tray and have it be planted. Yes, the planter box is perfect, especially if you just put the, a cage on top of the planter box. That way you can get like 12 inches of soil. Uh, if you, I mean, you know, there's, there's different uh, depths, but if you can get more than just a couple of inches of soil, there's all sorts of things that you can do uh, with putting plants in your cages. And Rob says, you look younger. Must have been the gish if tick. Okay, autocorrect did something <laughs> to, to it. But uh, uh, I look younger. Thank you very much. I am sure it's the lighting because, um, yeah, I noticed in Madagascar, I really looked gaunt in a lot of those pictures. And I say, like, oh, my goodness, just really 
getting old. Uh, but this lighting, yeah, this lighting's pretty good. It's all in the lighting, I tell you. And it changes, and I look and I go, oh, my goodness, I've been here. I, I realize how old I am. I, I'm, I'm in, for those who don't know, I'm in my 50s. And, uh, but I sure don't feel, I mean, I'm not supposed to be, I, I still feel like I'm supposed to be in my thirties. Um, but apparently my, the, the world, the calendar keeps going, but, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, ah, well, I'll just have to old, uh, age gracefully as gracefully as possible. Uh, oh, look at that. We got Portugal here. Hello, Claudio. Thank you very much for uh, dropping by. And uh, thank you very much for the big hug. I appreciate that. And Bjorn from Denmark. Thank you very much for dropping by. I love having all these people from around the world. And uh, Howard says you can propagate pothos as well. Oh, yeah, that's one of the fun things. It's amazing how many of these, uh, these indoor plants that we use, you can propagate uh, just about anything. And just about any of them and and i do i have propagation chambers there's, there's little vials of water that hang on my a uh, wall and that's my that's my decoration i love it i love it um let's see let's see we're talking about uh a fertilizer Okay, I'm just going back and uh, saying emerald uh, water dilutes liquid fertilizer inside the squirt bottle, inserting the tip directly inside the soil so no chameleon can reach. Oh, okay, well, that's an interesting idea. All right. Are there any ivy plants that are safe for chameleons? Uh, I don't know of any ivy plants that are not safe for chameleons. I don't know of any plants that other than that have sharp edges are thorns that are not safe for chameleons. See, that's the thing. I'm, I, I would imagine that there's one out there, but you know, I, I got to work off of actual evidence and we, I have yet to see a plant poisoning, even though we have uh, chameleons that eat plants that are supposedly poisonous. So right now I can't, I, I don't have any evidence of poisoning in chameleons. Um, Rob S says, oh, I was asking about a dragon. Uh, would love the dragon ledges. Can I order from the UK? The answer is yes, you can, but that it is so expensive to ship. I, it, I mean, when people from Europe ask, I, I have to be, I am almost embarrassed to give them the quote because it's just so expensive to get over the Atlantic. But uh, if you're willing to, uh, you're willing to, I, I can give a quote. If you'd like, just know that it often doesn't, uh, it often is shocking. Uh, let's see. Zev Green, how do you feel about feeding chameleons live lizards? And it's, it's it'll be part of their natural diet. Uh, so uh, I, I feed mine insects, but, you know, that I'm sure it would be uh, fine. Uh, I don't, I haven't, I don't have experience with how often and how much and that kind of thing, because I've just focused on insects. Um, so I can't give any advice in that way, but chameleons will take lizards. They'll take uh, birds. They'll take, uh, they'll take small mammals, anything that moves and fits in their mouth. Um, let's see. I don't know why, but I'm having a hard time keeping my pothos plants alive. They keep dying on me. And that's up for you to take a look. I mean, you can listen to the uh, the last episode, the podcast episode or the show. Either too much light, not enough light, too much water, not enough water. And it, even without knowing how much they need, if your pan, uh, pothos plants are dying and you go and the, uh, the soil is dry, it's probably not enough water. If it's sopping wet, probably too much water. If the leaves just can't flourish it, it may be uh, not enough light it is very rarely too much light although natalie said hers was too much light so yeah uh you got to know your situation but um you know go through that checklist and, and see let's see just bought two venus fly traps so we'll see how they do in there oh 
Lazaru, I will say that uh, Venus flytraps will work in your chameleon cage, especially up closer to the lights, especially if you have misters and foggers going off to keep them in those conditions. But when it comes to your winter time, uh, they need a dormancy. I mean, they come from South Carolina where there's actually snow on the ground. And so they literally, people literally put the uh, the rhizomes, the parts of the Venus flytrap, uh, the, the leaves die back and they literally put those in their refrigerator uh, because they need that dormancy to come back. And so uh, if you use Venus flytraps in your cage, uh, just uh, make sure they get there up high so they get enough light, but then that you can take them out easily uh, when when their growing season ends and they need a dormancy. And and if you do that, Venus flytraps will be great. And Ryan, thank you very much for your support here. Ryan has given me a super sticker and uh, really appreciate the support. And uh, it's it's wonderful that these uh, these platforms now allow us people who do do lives to be supported it's uh it's uh it's very nice and let's see i get the character saying you rock while showing their pumped bicep <laughs> thank you very much all right really appreciate it ryan uh let's see um let's see uh, uh ranunculus uh is nepenthes which is Oh, I don't know if it's a his or her. Who are you, Ranunculus? I do not. I, I keep seeing your name, Ranunculus, but I don't know who you are in the real world. Uh, you want to let me know what your name is? Because I like to know the names of the people who keep coming back. Uh, let's see. My Nepenthes, that's the tropical pitcher plant. Easily get red leaves coloration, which would imply good light. Yes, yes, that's good light. But on the other hand, the pitchers often dry out and start to crumble. Okay, good a uh, good question. So we've got good light. Uh, the first thing I would do, and of course I haven't seen your setup at all. You may already be doing this is, uh, do you fog? Do you keep, um, I mean, they like their humidity. And so, uh, you know, I'm just going to throw that out as a question. Um, let's see. Oh my goodness, I got to catch up on all of my of my chat. Howard, Bill, I wanted to publicly thank you for all you do. You're welcome, and thank you for uh, for uh, appreciating it. I follow many of your videos and have successfully bred my two panther chameleon. She has 18 viable eggs on her first clutch. Nice, nice. Yes, congratulations. And 18 is a nice size uh, start. Uh, so many people get overwhelmed with panther chameleons when they get like 30 or 40 eggs. So 18 is a good start. Uh, I think you're going to have a good time. So, uh, let's see. Rob saying, love you, Bill. Thank you very much. I appreciate the appreciation. I've been taking care of a veiled chameleon called, uh, Zeus. And excellent. All right, all right. I am going to try to get through my uh, my chat here. Um, do, do, do. <laughs> all right, Howard is uh, saying that I keep doing those walking trips to find branches. It keeps me alive. Yes, yes. Hiking hiking across uh, hill and dale to find my uh, my favorite sycamore branches for my chameleon cages. Yes, those keep me those keep me young, young, and. Um, Okay, someone says lantana plant. Um, um, I don't use lantana, although you know they were all over Madagascar as uh, they were. They're from the West Indies. They were introduced, but uh, you know there were some carpet chameleons running around the lantana. I think the question with the lantana is, uh, can you keep it alive inside your chameleon cage? Do you have enough light? Uh, but it's also more of a a, a lower bush. Uh, the ones in Madagascar, of course, were huge, but um, yeah, I I have not used that for chameleon cages because of the light issue and their their lower bushes. Um, doo -doo -doo. All right, all right, I'm going to go through the chats. Um, Rob is saying, 
I have the T5 6%. Really feel I'm lacking without the light bar. Yeah, the uh, the six percent that's a UVB bulb, so that's not going to give the plants anything that they need. Uh, they they need the uh, the broad spectrum light, the regular spectrum. Um, <laughs> why don't you make Dragon Strand available in Europe? You would probably have a market and I wouldn't have to use my vacation to build new cages. <laughs> uh, I would love to. Uh, and the reason why I don't is just because of what it takes to uh, get the cages over there. It is so expensive. And and then once they're there, I'd have to manage, manage that. So I, I can't just ship them because of the expense. And uh, so I am sorry. I wish there was a case. I, there was a way to do that. Um, did you do? Uh, Rob's asking, I have no light bar. Arcadia T5 6% heat bulb. Arcadia 65 watt veiled light bar. Uh, I would do, I would do, you need some sort of light. You can either do the 6500K T5 bulbs or else a, a light bar. I, of course, do both. Uh, I do the 6500K. Actually, I could do a whole lot of light bars. I mean, they'd be really expensive, but boy, that would work out nicely. I have one cage where I have, uh, I have three 6500K uh, uh, T5 lights, uh, one UVB bulb in there, and I'm using two Jungle Dawns, and I get some nice light in there. So yeah, the lights can get really, really expensive, but when you when you go all out and say, all right, I'm going to do it, regardless of the expense, it's amazing what happens inside that cage. Whew. And Lazarou from Scotland, uh, the one with the Venus flytraps, it's freezing here in the winter, minus temperatures often, so no problem giving them a dormancy. <laughs> yeah, you probably don't have a problem at all with that. Uh, so yeah, just take them out of the cage and uh, let them rest for three, four months. Uh, I don't know how much, how, I actually don't know how long they need to be dormant. Uh, I live in California and in Southern California, I've been able to, and actually Northern California, I've been able to keep them outside year round. Uh, we just barely, barely get cold enough in the winter. Um, so it's not as good as it should be, but uh, I can get away with it. Um, Let's see. <laughs> Rob is going out right now and ordering that light bar. Well, you're not going to regret it. You're going to get some really good light off of that thing. Um, let's see. Facebook user. Don't uh, read that some LED can damage chameleon's eyes. Oh, this is an endless topic. And, and honestly, I'm not going to be able to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, give you a whole rundown on, gosh, give me a second. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to give you a whole rundown on the whole LED damaging chameleon's eyes. I know it's a big discussion topic in the community, uh, more so out of the chameleon community because we just use the LED light bars and we don't have a problem. Uh, so what LEDs are being talked about there, I don't know. Uh, I can just tell you the LED light bars that we use, the Jungle Dawn, they're not going to damage the chameleon's eyes. Uh, so, uh, but I'm sure that there are good reasons why people are saying that about certain products. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. Since I don't have problems with any of the LED bars that I've been using, um, I haven't gotten too far into that situation. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, Perry Planeta loves the Greater Vasa Parrot from Madagascar. Go ahead, give them some screen time here. Um, have grow light for plants that emits purplish light. Would this be suitable for a veiled 
Sam, I'm going to say no. And the reason is because uh, the chameleons use so much of the spectrum. They're their main, their main, uh, the main way they take in information from the, uh, the, the world is by sight. And they see, they see what we see. They see into the ultraviolet. So they, they just have this, they see the world better than we do. Uh, but we, on our part, we need to give them as much of the spectrum as possible. Uh, those lights are designed only to give plants what plants need. Um, I, I'm, and I've got some like that as well. And I said, what the heck is this? But uh, okay, so supposedly they're designed for plants. But uh, when we do chameleon cages, we do need to provide as much of that spectrum as possible. And even when we give the broad spectrum that we do, that we have through the 6500K lights uh, and even the UVB, we're probably still, I, I'm pretty sure we are still uh, not giving the chameleon the full spectrums that they need. So that's that's a place that we have to grow uh, as, uh, as herpeticulturists. Um, in Germany, we're also encouraged to stay away from LEDs. Uh, I, I guess what once again I'll say, I don't have the background to to give a full analysis of that situation. Uh, so, so what happens in these communities is there is something that happens uh, somewhere. Somebody had a bad experience and connected a chameleon uh, bad experience with an LED. And maybe it was something the LED was doing. Uh, whatever it is, that gets passed down, that gets passed down, uh, and then people believe it. People uh, keep passing it down. Uh, and it may continue to be passed down to the point where uh, it's no longer valid. And so whenever we get these things that, keep chameleons away from LEDs or don't give chameleons distilled water or pothos is poisonous to male chameleons. What we have to do is dig in, find the kernel of truth, because all of these have a kernel of truth. Where did they start? And then uh, see, it, does that apply to our world right now? And uh, so I'll say on the LEDs, I don't know what the kernel of truth is. And, and the reason why I have no problem using LED bars right now, even though I don't know what the origin of that encouragement to stay away from LEDs is, is because I know how these things grow in the reptile community. And, and I have years and years of using these LED light bars. And so I don't, I, it, I, I can say the LED light bars that I've been using have been no problem. And, uh, and so I, I just have to dig in and figure out uh, what the uh, what the origin of this is. And maybe there's some LEDs that I don't want to be using. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be using LEDs that are so far apart that they look strange. Okay, so th now I'm just talking. Uh, I guess that's a big, long way of saying I don't know exactly what the situation is uh, with that warning. Um so, oh, okay. I'll do one more. All I got is T5 UVB and Arcadia light bulb, 75 watt, which both is okay. Uh, yeah, one, one of them, the Arcadia light bulb, which one is that? That's probably a heat, heat lamp. So you got a T5 UVB bulb. Okay, that's for UVB. And you've got a light bulb, 75 watt. That's probably the heat lamp. And that's for heat. And now you need um, either the LED bar or 6500K T5 fixture for the, uh, the, the vision light. That's also going to be the light that's going to feed the plants. So the plants and allow the chameleon to see. Um, and so, yeah, you, you, I haven't seen your setup, but it looks like you need, you don't need LED light. Uh, you do need, you can get the T5 6,500 K bulbs. Uh, so you're, I mean, I, I haven't seen your, I hope I'm understanding it correctly. You're welcome to send me a picture of your setup. 
on Instagram and, and I can take a look, but uh, you just need, well, we've, we've, we've split up the sun into three lights, uh, the UVB light, the heat lamp, and then the, uh, the heat, uh, natural uh, full spectrum light for vision. So you just need all something that gives you all three of those. So, ah, Ryan says, oh, this is what I love to hear. Um, good info today. Learned some good stuff. I am glad. I am glad that it's been useful. Uh, and often, and I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned just as much as everybody else does. Uh, by, and that's the wonderful thing about these live sessions is I get to hear from you and it helps me, uh, learn what's out there. Uh, I, I do a good job of keeping my, uh, my thumb on the pulse of what's going on in the community, but I love it when I actually have people it's, it's not a research project. It's, I actually have people talking to me and let me know what they're seeing and, and such. And, uh, and it lets me know how I need to grow. And that's what the Chameleon Academy really is all about. Uh, it's, it's about me growing and, uh, you, you, you all get to come along with me as I discover more and more about chameleon hereticulture. And we have fun putting together all of these cages, learning about plants and feeders and all this kind of stuff. So, uh, it, it's, it's such a big world. We, we use, we use chameleons to learn all of this stuff. Uh, it is just so much fun. There's so much for us to, to learn. So, you know, I'm on my eighth season of the Chameleon Academy podcast and I, I, I am certainly not gonna, I already have all of 2023 planned out. So no, I'm not gonna, uh, not going to uh, run out of anything to talk about anytime soon. So, uh, all right, everybody, we're coming to the end of this, uh, the show, James, you're, you're very welcome. And thank you for coming. And, um, oh, wait a minute, Jenny, we do have to talk about the benefits of the 300 watt Osram Vitalux in the future. I will take a look at what a 300 watt Osram Vitalux is. It sounds interesting and it sounds powerful. So let's let's go ahead and talk about it. Is that an LED uh, panel or something? Okay, I'm gonna. All right, I'm gonna take a, a, a screenshot of this and I'm gonna check into that. So. All right. Thanks, Bill. This has been so helpful. Started with chameleons a year ago, and it's been such a fun year. Excellent. I'm glad. And just hang around here. We're going to have a whole lot of fun. Um, do you have a job, and can you afford it? Keep it real, dude. <laughs> uh, I kind of have a job, um, and can I afford it? Depending upon what it is. There's a lot of things I can't afford. And me choosing to spend more and more time being a chameleon educator means there's more and more stuff that I cannot afford. Uh, but I am loving the life I'm living right now. And so uh, I'm going to do it for as long as possible. I've uh, I've taken a break from... I used to be a uh, in consumer electronics. I, I run ran product marketing teams for consumer electronics products. And uh, that was... That was fun and all, but um, through a series of decisions I made, uh, I decided I really wanted to explore what I could do in the chameleon world if I did it full time. And so I uh, right now I'm mostly being supported by my Dragon Strand Chameleon Caging Company a little bit and, and a little bit from the wonderful people that support me on Patreon that <laughs> can't tell you how helpful that is and for people like Ryan who give me uh, the, these badges and things during the, the lives. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing right now. And I got to tell you, I am happier, uh, happier now than I have been at any other, my, my, most other stages of life. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not a way to get rich, but gosh, I'm so much happier. Uh, Anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. Genevieve, uh, thank you. Great Western weekend. Uh, 
and ranunculus is going to send me a name on instagram and rob has a, uh, has enjoyed it and jenny has learned great all right everybody i'm going to sign off thank you so much for joining here uh the next time i go live is going to be tuesday on my instagram account chameleon academy and uh and then well you're gonna get all the other videos and stuff that you normally do so uh thank you very much for joining me here and i will see you later